Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the latest in our series of ISC webinars. Today, we're going to be talking about social mobility. Um, I've got um, an esteemed panel of experts with me, and we're going to be covering this, 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 this subject in, in some depth. Um, for those of you that are new to ISC webinars, just a little bit of um, background on how these, how these work. Um, we, because there's so many of you joining, we've got up to two, I think we've got over 200 people registered for this webinar today. So rather than having you all trying to talk over each other, please use the questions dialog box if you've got any questions. So if you pop your questions on there, I will act as moderator um, on the questions for the, the panel. Um, this webinar automatically records. So at the end, um, you will get a link later on this afternoon that will actually take you back to the recording if there's anything that you want to catch up on, or um, feel free to share the webinar amongst sort of colleagues and friends. Um, we'll also put the webinar up on our website and our YouTube channel. Um, some of you may be new to the ISC because what we've done in reaction to this crisis is actually all our webinars and podcasts we put in front of our paywall, so we made them um, accessible to everybody. So if you're new to the ISC, uh, welcome, um, but you will have access to these on our on our on our website. Um, so, like I said, you, you please feel free to use those. Um, so, I just suggest we get cracking straight away. So, let's do introductions first of all. I'm going to go around the panel as I see them on on their screen. So, Sarah, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Atkinson. I'm Chief Executive of the Social Mobility Foundation. We're a charity that works to make a practical difference to help young people. Uh, enter universities and professions, and we also run the Social Mobility Employers Index. Thanks, Sarah. Laura, do you want to go next? Hi, I'm Laura Yates. I'm Head of Graduate Talent at the law firm Clifford Chance. I'm currently sat in my kitchen and the kids are hungry, so if you hear noise, it's small ones running around by my feet. I'll try to kick them. <laughs> well, they can come and give us a wave if they want to. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Naomi, do you want to text? Naomi, do you want to text? My name is Naomi Carmen. I'm a senior manager at Rare, who are a diversity specialist helping ethnic minority students and students from lower income households into top jobs. And we also help organisations contextualise students' achievements with the contextual recruitment system. Thank you, Naomi. And last but not least, Phil. Hi, uh, Phil Wilson. I'm Head of uh, Assessment and Diversity at the Civil Service Fast Stream and Early Talent Team. Um, we look after graduate roles, apprenticeships, uh, internships and also schools programmes as well. Fantastic. Thanks all. Um, and thanks for taking the time out to take part in this today. I know everybody's very, very, very busy at the moment. So um, we've all agreed there's kind of a, a rough agenda and some questions that we're going to go through. As I said, if you've got any questions for the panel, please pop them into the dialogue box. We've got plenty of time at the end of today's session for, for questions. Um, so I'd like to start um, with yourself, first of all, Laura. So the, this coronavirus has caused significant disruption to organisations like yours, as it has to many others. Um, how, have your team, how have you and your team had to react? Um. I was thinking about this and I think there's probably three words or, or three sentences I'd use to describe how we've been reacting over the last uh, three months. Quickly at times, sensitively, um, and then I think for me the last uh, point is around having to make decisions um, and take action without having all of the information, which is is something we're, we're used to, but probably not at the speed and, and, and the level that we've been seeing over the last uh, two, two and a half months. So I think for us, the team has really been focused on ensuring that our current trainees and our future trainees are able to perform at their fullest potential whilst acknowledging this really unique environment that we're all faced with. Um, and I think a lot of that uniqueness has, has manifested itself in some of those more challenging mental health issues, um, which has required the team to invest a huge amount of time and effort in that pastoral support. Um, and I was trying to think of some some tangible examples of what they've been doing um, to provide that additional support. So some of the things they've been doing is um, getting data to help um, implement meaningful and effective interventions. And that's led to us um, introducing a working from home allowance for our trainees to buy equipment 
Um, that was £400. That was announced in the first couple of weeks. We've also introduced a number of um, additional mental health sessions where we've had mental health experts coming in and running webinars in small cohort groups to allow them to share experiences and tools and techniques that they have um, found worked for them in this new environment. So many of them were talking about being able to deal with uh, mental health challenges previously by going to the gym um, and having a exercise regime, which has obviously had to change within lockdown. So the peer group support has been providing examples of, of how they've adapted to that. Um, and then we also um, listened to some feedback and gave them uh, some additional spend to do some virtual socials because they felt that that peer group support was incredibly important um, to get through this very unique learning experience for them. Um, and of course, your graduate programs have been significantly affected on uh, actually on a previous webinar. I think Laura, you were, you were talking about, it, but also on um, on our sort of legal sector town halls. Um, but what's been the impact on your on your diversity strategy so far? Um, not much in the immediate term, because when we look at our diversity strategy, it's very much the long game. This is this is about um, what we've been doing over the last 10 years and how we see our function and our organisation progressing over the next 10 years. Um, so it is very much the long game. I thought it might be useful just to run through um, what our focus is in terms of our strategy, because that might help contextualise some of the, the bits I go on to explain. So we've got six elements of our strategy. It's about providing meaningful pre-university work experience and creating a pipeline of future talent. It's about building credible and long-lasting relationships with local schools under our community outreach schools program. It's about challenging the traditional selection methods and breaking down any, any barriers to entry. It's about providing genuine alternative channels to access the profession. It's about using platforms such as social media to reach new pools of talent. And it's also uh, finally ensuring that no candidate self-selects out due to financial hardship. So they're the, the, the six key strands of our strategy. Um, and I don't think they fundamentally change. But what I think lockdown has provided us with is this introspective period. It's allowed us to go back in and look at the barriers that, that might exist through a different lens. Um, for example, when I was talking about that, that the element of equipment and people not having that physical setup in their yeah. home environments, um, and looking at barriers such as grades. And I know when we look at academic achievements and grades, many of you will know that we've dropped our UCAS requirements, we've moved to contextual recruitment, but actually looking at how we assess talent and use grades in this new environment needs to, to have um, a team looking at to ensure that there aren't barriers that we might inadvertently miss in, in, in this new landscape. Um, so I think when I was thinking about, well, what how is this impacting our diversity strategy? I think there's a couple of key elements that I'm trying to maintain a focus on, and that's about safeguarding investment um, it's about ensuring that i'm vocal in in senior stakeholder meetings around the importance of this long-term commitment and this long-term investment um, and not making any short-term cuts um, to, to to those programs that we've been working on for over a decade now and i think what also really excites me is the opportunity that the new season presents. Um, so we're currently working through uh, what our plans look like for, for the coming academic season. And we very much approached this, not in the early stages. In the early stages, we were thinking, well, let's just replicate what we've done in the past and put it all in virtual platforms. But I think now it's very much an opportunity to see this as a revolution. It's, it's allowed us to say, well, actually, let's not just replicate what we've done in the past. Let's look at this in a fundamentally different way. Let's look at this in a way that allows us to genuinely democratise access to not only information, but opportunities. There shouldn't be any, um, uh, any further constraints to um, uh, things like geographical access to those opportunities, to restrictions on numbers for programmes. Um, and some of that's uh, manifested itself in in things like we're launching a global virtual internship program which will be completely open access we're looking at how we develop a, a curriculum of content that's focused on meaningful skills and knowledge development that again will be open access um, and some of those elements like our prime commitment so many of uh, your members who are a part of the legal sector 
will be aware of our prime commitment where we see ourselves offering work experience placements to year 12 and 13 students um, based on the proportion of numbers of graduate offers we make. And actually what we've been looking at with, our, with regards to our prime programme with this COVID lens is how we can provide additional support given that many of those year 12, 13 students within our pipeline might be making decisions about delaying that entry to university, might be having significant issues with regards to home learning, and we're, we're expanding our investment in partnerships like my tutor. So we provide one on one tutoring support to our prime students. And we're looking at expanding that um, to cover this really strange period where, they, where they're perhaps struggling in that home environment. Um, so I think that's where our focus is in terms of our strategy. It's about um, looking at being able to revolutionize rather than just replicate and really looking at the Im immediate term as to how we can make changes to break down barriers that we're identifying with individuals already in the pipeline. But it's, I think our, our key role across um, early talent is really about advocating uh, for change and being really vocal about safeguarding investments. I think that's going to be critical over the next six months, Stephen, to be honest. Yes, because we're hearing from lots of employers that, uh, well, and, and universities as well, that budgets are really under, under severe pressure at the moment. Um, is there anything, I guess, more operational you've had to do for, for those disadvantaged students, Laura? So I'm thinking about things like, um, oh, I don't know, providing laptops, you know, the problems that people, you mentioned, you know, people's environments at home, you know, do they have access to broadband, things like that. Have you had to kind of factor some of those considerations into your work? We, yeah, we have with our current trainees um, and, and that was dealt with fairly early on in terms of that working from home allowance. What we're trying to do with our pipeline um, and interestingly we went out to we, we've transferred uh, our first year vacation scheme program to a virtual um, delivery program um, for the end of this month and actually we went out to see if any of those individuals needed additional support and most of them didn't most of them were getting that support from their individual universities so I think where our focus now is in this pipeline for our prime scheme these year 12 and 13 students and trying to identify ways we can offer meaningful support to them um, so the tutoring is an example of that um, and then we're trying to work out if people are taking gap years and, and delaying admission to universities, how can we provide support? We don't have the answers um, to that at the moment, but that's certainly something that we're looking at at the moment. Great, great. Thanks, Laura. I'm sure we'll come back to some of those, those themes as the questions come through. Just a reminder, everybody, that if you've got questions that you'd like to ask one of our panels, please use the dialogue box um, that you'll see on your screen, and then I can moderate those, those, those questions a little bit later. Um, so, Phil, can I just move on to you now? The, the civil service fast streamers, you know, been known for investing heavily in social mobility programmes. You know, you've been sort of very closely involved in some of the initiatives from the, the cabinet office to, to tackle tackle this agenda. So, what what the overall impact has has COVID nineteen had on these programmes, Phil? Well, um, we're really very aware, acutely aware, of the need to continue to provide opportunities to those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, but also the other diversity groups that we focus on, ethnic minority groups and um, disability groups in particular. So we want to maintain that despite COVID. It's really, really important. Um, and I suppose our, our activity at the moment particularly is around the diversity internships, which is a, a very big area of work. We had about uh, 800 internships lined up this year which is uh, so significant so many opportunities for young people um so we've been looking at that we, we put the dates back which uh, is probably the simplest thing to do in the short term and um and then we've been looking at other options uh we've been speaking to the host departments across the civil service to see if we can deliver the programs in terms of the work experience anyway uh, via you know virtual delivery and, and that's that's really something that we're still discussing and we'll make a decision on that in the next week or two uh, exactly what we're proposing and, and obviously communicate that quickly with the the interns um, but we will certainly deliver come what may webinars skills webinars and uh, uh, coaching sessions positive action coaching sessions and make sure we are providing opportunities uh, obviously dealing with the uh, the IT issues that we were Laura was referring to and uh, and other aspects like that and we've we put a lot of emphasis generally in uh, in the team around mental health for our 
graduates and, and others, and um, uh, done a lot in respect to uh, how we make sure virtual delivery works. So it's sort of a, an evolving picture, uh, but we are, as I say, really committed to maintaining the opportunities as much as we can. So are there any practical steps you've had to take that? You mentioned technology. You, I mean, those are pretty big numbers, 800 people still trying to, to, to maintain the experience, but that must be, must be really challenging. It is. It is. I mean, the IT, uh, we hope, um, can you know, mostly be resourced uh, by their, their personal equipment. But the government uh, sector has particular issues around security of information, access to government sites. So we're still working through that. There are variations um, across different areas which we need to deliver. So we haven't quite got to that point because we haven't formally informed the interns yet that we are you know, proposing perhaps to go virtual if that's required. Um, so it's still running through. We've obviously communicated what we know, but it's, uh, we'll be you know, explaining that in the next week or two, as I say. And so one of the things that we, um, when we had a virtual catch up, Phil, we talked about actually previous financial crashes, sorry, pre previous recession. So, you know, we both worked through the financial crash and of course a, a shrinkage in, in the number of vacancies tends to lead to two things. One is um, a bit of a flight to safety in the minds of students. So public sector roles become more attractive, particularly because actually those are the employers that seem to be um, holding up in terms of vacancies, and that's very much showing through in our data at, at the moment. You know, obviously all sectors are affected, affected differently, but the public sector does seem to, does seem to be holding up. So of course that creates extra competition for those roles that are that are there. So are you worried that that increasing competition is likely to impact um, uh, you know, social mobility candidates more than more than maybe perhaps other students? Yeah, it's it's so so important. Um, obviously, nobody knows exactly <laughs> what applications might might uh, arrive um, at the next campaign. Um, one thing we we do know for sure is that the the general trajectory of applications is is up and up. Um, so we three years ago, forty four thousand uh, applied to our graduate program. Then it was fifty six thousand. Last year it was sixty five thousand. And it could go up again from there, and that's really significant numbers. Um, and obviously, that that could well be because of the economic turbulence, as you say, a, a sort of safe port in the storm, which um, makes perfect sense, perhaps. Um, but we do think other um, factors are at play. Actually, um, I mean, one thing about the work we've been doing is it's so strongly highlighted at the moment. Um, it has been in the last few years with Brexit and then COVID, uh, all the work that's been done you know, by the civil service and government generally. Um, so there's increased interest perhaps because of that. Um, there's a general trend of uh, students perhaps wanting to give something back to, uh, to make a difference and so on. So they're sort of drawn to that. Um, dare I say, because we're number one in the Times Top 100, that may have had an impact. And I don't want to mention that again, but it's just something that, uh, happen to be possibly an issue. I'm talking about 2019 here, I should say. Um, but it's complicated because going back 10 years to the financial crisis, um, I was looking at the data. Um, we actually had a drop in applications um, uh, by about 16% when there was that major recession. And that was because of an entirely different issue. And that was because and you mentioned to Laura about um, budgets and so on, we actually had to pare down our marketing budget significantly 10 years ago, and that really had a huge impact on engaging students. So, um, you know, it's it's an issue, and uh, it, but it's complicated by a variety of factors. Um, in terms of that issue about increased competition, again, that's really uh, interesting and maybe not straightforward in the sense that, as I say, we, we, we've had uh, major increases in terms of applications, and that does include socioeconomic background students and other diversity categories. Uh, but at the same time, we've also been able to maintain increases in representation of lower socioeconomic background students. So we've been able to do both, have higher applications and have uh, you know um, better success rates. So I think we've been doing, able to do that just by the sort of measures that we've been putting in place, and that would be things like partnerships with people like Rare, and Naomi's on, on the uh, 
um, webinar of course um, uh, working with our internal networks um, doing a lot of outreach uh, huge campus uh, representation and uh, um, you know uh, going out to universities on, on a very large scale um, to engage with target groups to engage with lower socioeconomic students um, stripping away elements of the selection process which aren't positive um, or were, were found not to be positive and that was a lot of that was from the bridge group of research that they did a few years ago now doing regional assessment um, doing fast tracking of uh, diverse interns into the selection process um, and defining the talent um, that we're looking for a bit more clearly and uh, reducing time to offer was, was another thing about trying to uh, increase engagement by by making it a less lengthy process. So I think all of those things and various other things as well actually um, sort of mitigated the issue of higher competition. So let's hope again that will be the case because we're continually improving and trying to make our process as fair as possible. Great, thanks for that. And you mentioned, I mean, there's, there's a eye-watering numbers in terms of some of your, your application statistics. Yeah. Hmm. It's, um, yeah. um, I think it's something that, again, in the messages we're trying to put out, we're trying to be responsible. So then we have to be realistic about what's happening with vacancies. Actually, I think there's a danger that all students think that the graduate market is shut down and there are no jobs. We're actually you know, by far the majority of employers are recruiting and, and will recruit into the new year. So there is that there is that that real danger that people disengage just because it's a bit difficult and, and, and assume that there, there are no jobs actually at all. And um, Sarah, can I just come to you and, and thinking about this reduction in vacancies, the the, the reduction in, in internship programmes um, and how that, that do you think that could disproportionately affect those from from disadvantaged backgrounds? Yes, we, we think it could. I mean, there, there are two risks going on at the same time for, for students like the ones we work with. One is that firms may put less effort, less focus on supporting social mobility because of budgets, because of capacity, uh, you know, in some cases because it was always something they were struggling with and it may just go into the too difficult box right now. So there's that risk that uh, that less effort is put into supporting those students to be able to to succeed while at the same time you know disadvantage is is growing is being exacerbated by educational experience the social experience uh the access that that our students have had so if both of those things are to happen at the same time that which was already a problem could really start to to widen so we need we need both we need both firms to think about continuing to maintain that focus whilst also recognizing that delivering as we are online and in a difficult environment you know you have to think even harder and you have to really turn your mind to how that disadvantage can play out both of those are they're fixable with effort um, but they won't happen if we don't pay attention you mentioned online online recruitment there i think one of the the most obvious um, impacts of, of the current crisis is those employees that are still recruiting are doing it all virtually and some of them doing it very successfully um, and I you know it's very difficult to predict the future but I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of that sticks because actually it's easier to do online it's less resource intensive there's probably cost savings um, but um, one of the conversations we had before this about is, is that likely to impact more um, um, certain pools of students, whether it's through lack of tech that we talked about earlier. Have you got, have you got any concerns about that um, at the moment? Yeah, we've, we've talked to our students, both ourselves, so that we can be confident as we deliver our own programmes online, that we're, we're making them effective and successful, and also thinking about how we can advise the employers we work with and, and monitor this through the index. I mean, the obvious thing is, is the limitations uh, of, of poverty mean you may have less tech. Um, much as Laura's found, actually, our students, certainly our undergraduate students, have the kit in most cases. Um, they haven't necessarily got the Wi-Fi connections, um, and they certainly haven't got the guaranteed private space, quiet. You know, they're not in domestic environments where they can work in a study or a spare room. Uh, you know, lots of our students are supporting younger siblings. 
um, they're in tight family setups. So sometimes it's about, it's always about asking. Sometimes it's about making kit available, using platforms that will work on all devices. You know, some of our students are going to be using a phone or a tablet quite a lot of the time, or they're going to have to uh, watch recordings back. So being conscious of that. But also it's about uh, in your guidance and in your support to young people, kind of owning and recognising that not all environments are the same. You know, how will you be flexible about timing? Will you offer breaks? Um, talking up front about how you're going to treat interruptions um, from other family members or from breakdowns in tech. Um, and, and just watch those assumptions. It's incredibly easy. Our first draft of our of our safeguarding online guidance talked about not not doing online events from your bedroom, and we pretty quickly realised if that's the room, then that's the room. So you know, recognising the space, the environment. Not everybody is in the same position, and being kind of upfront about how you will recognise and be flexible to the environment that that the young people are in is so important. It's also, you know, again, we knew already before COVID that uh, less privileged students are just less confident and they're less confident online. If you've been working in a school where you've been having uh, your lessons delivered and you've been having extracurricular activities all delivered online and you're comfortable and confident on Zoom and Teams and webinar and Microsoft, then you're much more able to feel confident and assertive when it comes to an online environment. Um, some of our students don't have that. Um, so again, supporting students to engage online, showing how you're helping them to use the systems. Um, and of course, as ever, just as much online as in face-to-face uh, -face delivery, you know, being conscious that superficial polish may not be something that students from a disadvantaged background have got or can bring. So that kind of second look, that kind of understanding that how someone presents superficially may not be a, the best guide to the potential they've really got um, is going to be super important. Are you finding that it's harder to reach students as a result? Of, are you engaging at the same rate with your students? Is it harder to engage with them? I know some of the work you do in schools, is it tougher to reach schools? So, so far, engagement has been brilliant. Uh, our students are more engaged and more motivated than ever because our students know that it's going to be tough for them. They knew it was tough anyway. It's doubly tough now. So they are very up for engagement. And also out of school, out of university, uh, they are missing interaction, stimulation, support. So, so engagement is good so far. But when we think about recruiting students for next year, uh, yeah, we are concerned about, again, the capacity schools will have, uh, the appetite. If there's a big focus on making up for that educational slide and there's an intensity of focus on that, then the capacity for the broader social, cultural capital and engagement and events that we know is so important for our students to be able to operate on a level playing field with their more privileged peers you know there could be a pressure on that and i'm so pleased to hear laura talking about recognizing that as part of of work experience and pipeline that the networking the shared experience the kind of social aspects we've really got to think about how to support those as well as the more straightforward uh, knowledge that you can transfer online and this stuff isn't easy uh, it, it's not a, it, these aren't straightforward transfers of events that you would do face to face to an online format. Um, but thinking that through is so so important. I and mean, just another a quick question that's just come through. I, I was thinking, obviously, the, um, your organisation has a pretty broad geographic reach. Are you, are you, is there any regional dimension to this, or is it pretty much everybody's in in the same boat at the moment? So it, it, pretty much everyone's in the same boat. And again, uh, engage, you know, one of the benefits of online, if you're using it really intelligently, is you absolutely can open up and reach students and, and make connections in places that otherwise would be, would be hard to notice. But again, on, it's incredibly easy when you're creating online content to just transfer things straight in, not notice 
that you've talked about year 12 when it's S5 and it's year 13 in Northern Ireland and we're talking to students right across the piece, not notice um, that not all your students are in London when you're not talking to people who are across the piece, you know, it's very easy to kind of build those assumptions in if you're not careful. So again, we've had to pay attention, we've had to work with employers to just pay attention to those checks on, is your content genuinely accessible, genuinely open to everyone's background? Are you accidentally building some of those assumptions in? But it's it's definitely one of the opportunities of, of online is that you can reach uh, people who are geographically not uh, in the same place as you are and also of course you can track that engagement so quickly uh, you don't have all the information up front but one of the benefits is you can see uh, what engagement you've had you can literally see the slide the stage of the recruitment process the piece of the webinar where people dropped off and you can target that quite quickly and make changes so one of the things we've really got to watch as we deliver online is that we don't set things in stone, um, but that we use that potential to adapt and flex really fast. Um, we watch the data, we watch what it's doing to students from disadvantaged backgrounds and we move it if it's not having the right impact uh, so that we can really kind of nail the opportunities. Great, great, thanks Sarah. Um, just um, moving over to yourself Naomi, um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was qualifications because there's been a lot in the press around um, Oh, the way that um, A levels and GCSEs are going to be marked. Um, their universities, of course, are also facing the same pressures. Pressures, and I hear things about you no know, detriment policies. Policies, and we've already had you know a bit of a conversation this morning around actually how employees, anyway, were thinking about using qualifications. And I know this is something that yourselves at Rare has um, been been very heavily involved with over over recent years. Um, have you got any concerns that the, the way that qualifications may be graded might particularly affect? Um, you know, um, those from those from poorer backgrounds. Yes, the the way that teachers have been asked to contribute to the grading system is to firstly predict grades for students based on mock exams and work that's been done already in the year, and then also to rank students, so to rank them in order of expected achievement, and then finally Ofqual, who regulates qualifications and standards for exams will standardise across the country and what that means is they'll take into account historical performance for schools and try to make sure that those predictions are in line with what you'd normally expect to see. Um, unfortunately what we are used to seeing is educational inequality when it comes to outcomes for students from low income backgrounds and also for some students from some ethnic minority groups. And what I'm concerned about is that there is evidence to suggest that high attaining lower income students in particular tend to have their grades under predicted by teachers. And there's evidence that for some ethnic minority groups, um, including black students, students perform better blind. So when the assessment is blind, i.e. an external GCSE assessment, they perform better than when it's internally assessed by teachers. And so the concern is that this grading system will bring those existing inequalities to light even more, and students might end up receiving grades that don't really reflect their ability. And for students who are high performing, but not in a school that historically has performed highly, they're a bit worried that their grade might be capped when the standardization is done. So we work with 160 black students each year for Target Oxbridge, helping them to apply to those universities. And a large number of our students are also, you know, free school meals eligible from low income backgrounds, give them the interactions between race and class. And some of those students are worried that because they're due to be the first person in the year to get an A star, for example, they might not actually get that grade once off for standardizers. So we are concerned about that. So are the students themselves voicing these concerns or is it, is it more teachers, employers, other stakeholders? I think it's a wide range of people. So we've had some students on our programme on Target Oxbridge say that they are a bit worried because not that their teachers don't believe in them necessarily in some cases, but that they're worried because their school hasn't historically performed super well. And they are, for some of our students, the first people to get Oxbridge offers from their school and maybe the first people to be predicted the A star. And so they're waiting to see if the standardisation process will mean they can't actually attain that top grade. Um, other students are worried 
generally about you know the predictions so some know they've got good relationships with their teachers and their teachers are very supportive and so that's not quite a concern but if they perhaps had had to fight quite hard for their prediction they're a bit worried that when the teacher is actually asked to rank them or asked to predict it might not come out in line with what they were expecting um, i think there's also just a lot of uncertainty they're not going to know what they're predicted the teachers aren't permitted to tell them um, and so until results day they won't know what the grade is and there isn't yet a completely clear plan for how people might be able to um, redress the grade if they don't think it's the fair one. I think there's been mention of the chance to maybe reset, the chance to appeal, but I think we're still awaiting details that allow people to make plans of action in the event it doesn't go well. And of course the danger of that appeal process might be well into the autumn when actually there's people who want to be starting university this autumn then you know, it puts, um, it put, puts, puts delays um, very much into it. So are you hearing much from, whether it's institutions or employers, you know, a recognition that this might be a problem and there's something that needs to be done about it? Yes, we put something out to our clients of highlighting some of these challenges and got a really good response actually from people saying, okay, we're, we're now aware of this and we'll be keeping an eye on it. What we were saying to employers and to the, the clients that we do work with is that, if you've been contextualizing, it will be even more important going forward to keep contextualizing and really double down on that. And if you haven't yet been doing that, we'd really recommend getting it set up to do that. So what our contextual recruitment system has been helping organizations to do is put students' achievements in context, looking at their academic, their socioeconomic, and their personal disadvantage that they've experienced and therefore where you know a b a b b might not be what a firm's normally seeing from applicants for a student who's maybe been on free school meals came to the country as a refugee and went to a bottom 10 percent performing school that's a brilliant grade and you should definitely be seeing them and without that data you can't pick things in context i think with what's happening now sarah and laura have both spoken to the challenges that students from lower income households will be facing just as they try to sit their exams i i mean my sister even had to finalize her degree at home writing essays she was lucky that she had space to do that but not everyone will have done so even for university students as well the final grades they're producing this year will have been done in hard circumstances and data such as data on socioeconomic background or personal circumstances will give employers a chance to see where students might have achieved grades in even tougher than normal circumstances. Because am I right that most universities are talking about a no detriment policy, i.e. they won't be pushing anybody's marks back, um, they can only increase, I don't, I don't quite, have you had any thoughts on what that actually means in practice? Yes, I think what the challenge is at the moment is universities differ quite a lot and there are different policies being adopted but generally speaking there seems to be an approach of no detriment which means if you are on track for a 2-1 the hope will be that you won't have a final award that doesn't give you that 2-1 um, and so that's what's being proposed in a lot of places i'm aware that some employers do look quite closely at module grades um, and i think we'd say that employers might want to take stock of the fact that those grades that are being awarded this year the exact module mark might not mean what it would usually mean because the exams have been sat in difficult circumstances um, and so I think it's just being aware of what the context is for any grades coming out now and also this isn't an issue that will just affect one cohort so we have students who are in year 12 at the moment their AS, AS exams have been cancelled most schools are just going to have them sit them next year but these students will be in the pipeline for a while the current year 11s will all be awarded GCSEs that they haven't sat and that might affect their A-level choices, it might affect them what they can go on to do for university. So this is not a short-term thing to consider, these students will be in our pipeline for the next five years. Five years. Um, is there a danger, do you think, whereby, um, whereby um, more, more diverse students, um, in a sense they place a it's might be a bit stereotypical, but but a bit more kind of reliance on that grades. Grades are my ticket to something different. Whereas actually students from a more affluent background are like, well, I might still be aiming for good grades, but it's not the end of the world if I don't get them. I don't know. Do you have any concerns that that might be again, if if people do suffer a bit with their grades, the the, the impacts might be greater um on their on their sort of motivation, not motivation, but their their aspirations. I think 
for students who don't have a network that can buoy them up if their academics don't go well that's a challenge so I think for more privileged students if their grades don't go well but their parents can get them and in somewhere through a network is not quite so concerning or if you know your parents can afford for you to remark all of your exams it's not quite so concerning so I don't think it's so much that the students from lower income backgrounds it's their motivation or aspiration that's hit by that it's just that they don't have that many options you they focus on securing the grades because they need to be able to turn up to the employer's door with them because they don't bring with them a network that can take them through and so I think the important thing is as, as Laura's been saying for organizations to to keep focus on their diversity strategies and also to to keep searching broadly so we've been really happy to see that firms have been even more interested in our online recruitment platform for the law Vantage, which allows students to sign up online really quickly and for free and gives firms a chance to search broadly maybe outside of the usual university network that they can access physically um, and also targeting so targeting by contextual recruitment data and targeting by interest in terms of industry um, and just keeping the, the pool really broad because if you don't have a network in this time and your grades don't go as well, you don't have anything to buoy you up in the way that a privileged student might. And so I think the onus is definitely on employers to be contextualizing and also to be using the new tools that are out there to keep broadening the pool. And then finally, I think for employers, being conscious of these grades as a potential challenge and when going into the next recruitment round, thinking about adverse impact monitoring, not as an event to do after it's all finished but to keep an eye on as the process is going if you can see that your grade requirement at this point is having particular groups slip out don't don't wait for it to be over to to think about correcting that be aware of it at the time and see if you can alter things in a way that's fair but reflective of context to ensure those people don't drop out of the system when they're talented and you ultimately want to hire them great Thanks, Naomi. Um, so we've had um, quite a few questions through. Um, I'll, I'll try and summarise some of them rather than go through them all, all one by one because there, there is a little bit of repetition and also there's quite a lot of them. So um, and one of the themes coming through this that actually um, there may actually be a, a, a little bit of an opportunity here actually as everything moves a bit more virtual later in the year. So will employers actually be targeting more institutions because actually done online there's less physical need to travel to places and actually with you know some of the the data driven tools we have we talked about contextualized recruitment we talked about better virtual systems being developed so i wonder if any of you've got any thoughts on actually whether there's um there's something positive that might come out of this is actually employers being able to actually reach a greater pool of students than maybe they were or did do previously i can say from our point of view it's something we're really really focused on at the moment in terms of um identifying the target universities that are most suitable in terms of diversity and also we look at um, sort of their, their previous success as well it's it, it's one of the other factors but we've actually commissioned uh, Bridge Group to, to redo the list that they did a few years ago to try to uh, update the the profile of universities and make sure that we're you know, fully focused on those that institutions that are most uh, likely to bring in diversity um, in a successful way. Um, I, th I think one of the things for us is that we we would be nervous about um, going out uh, to uh, to too many institutions if they weren't uh, within our target um, sort of groups um, because we already have. Uh, large-scale numbers of applications and it, it probably wouldn't serve much purpose to do to do that so anything we do and, and anything that the virtual you know capability provides to us uh, would have to be very focused and we're, we're, we're as I say at the moment we're trying to update the approach to targeting um, institutions interestingly from our perspective I don't know whether this actually gives an opportunity to see the death of that targeting of institutions and uh, we've always historically had those relationships with institutions that have generated previous applications generated previous hires we've got relationships with the faculties the career services and I'm not entirely sure that model will exist this time next year and 
it, and, and, and there's lots of different things that need to be balanced when looking at that because you need to ensure that you do, uh, as we've talked about, have that broad, Naomi, you were saying that broad pool, um, that you, you've got that broad awareness, that you're, you're, you, you've got that broad brand awareness, and you're also balancing with the reality of the vacancies that you have. And I don't think anyone's end, under any illusions that going into the deepest recession that any of us have ever seen, we're all going to be inundated with a, a huge number of vacancies. So it's it's somehow balancing that 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 new model of being able to raise access to the masses to information and knowledge and online opportunities and then somehow balancing that with how that translates to in, in, in employability outcomes and and how that 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 and I don't know what the solution is there and and, and both might have um uh, benefits in, in, in pursuing independently in terms of raising that general uh, knowledge and uh, an opportunity base for the masses. But I do think there's that conflict with the fact that we're all going to be faced with hard decisions around what those vacancy numbers look like in the coming 12, 18 months. Um, I've had a follow-up question for you, Phil, and it's somebody, I think, from an institution that um, might not be within your sort of one of the ones that you that you do target. Is there any advice um, that they should be giving to their students in terms of applying to, to yourselves? I'm assuming it's open application, open platform, it's, there's absolutely. no barriers there? Not at all, no, absolutely. Um, it's The information will be um, presented uh, on our website, of course, and social media and, and everything like that. Um, but in terms of advice, I suppose it's trying to understand the different schemes that we offer um, and uh, obviously identify which uh, of those options best match the, the students um, and of course get um, some insight around the selection process that we offer. We have a sort of generic selection process and then some more specific um, elements right at the end, a sort of final selection stage. Um, so it is about trying to prepare, trying to identify which schemes are most suitable um, and uh, there's some sort of you know, examples of course of, of the approach the selection approach that we we take and uh, that that can be looked at as well um, but uh, broadly it's it's that sort of preparation um, yeah um, there's a, uh, a question stroke comment from from Paul um, over at Exeter who talks about um, concurring with a lot has been been said already um, and he also talks about the sort of the, the squeezed middle of students, so universities having hardship funds for the poorer students, but actually there are the students that are on kind of the, the, the boundary there, and actually is there a danger that those students get, get missed? And actually there's a couple of other questions that also sort of um, or comments that, that talk about actually there's always this focus on graduate programmes, but actually are there um, other very good entry routes into graduate roles that sometimes get get missed out and and actually students can go into go into those i can see you're nodding your head sarah do you, do you have anything to add to those comments yeah i think i think that's right i think the um uh, openness about the different routes and the different potential is important and again and your stats i think Stephen, show this you know apprentice opportunities are being really really squeezed uh, and we've always had a worry about the extent to which uh, graduate apprenticeships really are that that alternative equal and alternative route for, for for students to to enter and to achieve but i think again the opportunity that this presents to to look at that and to consciously think about the outcomes that you are hoping and expecting to secure through those routes and as i think naomi said you know monitoring it in real time and making changes you know, it will be catastrophic if universities employers ofs off call everybody waits three years and then looks and says oh yeah yeah that was really bad wasn't it all sorts of dreadful things happen but we do have we don't need to wait for the case to be made to pay attention to disadvantaged students. We know we know there's a problem that we need to pay attention to and fix. We know we need to do some things quickly that may not be perfect, but that will help and, and make a difference. And we need to do that and to look and to be confident about, I think Laura said it right at the beginning, you know, you won't have full information. Um, do your best trust it watch what's happening as a result of it and if it isn't working the way you want it to change it quite fast 
rather than waiting uh, till, till you're absolutely certain by which point you will have compounded. And I think that's going to be true at every different entry route uh, that, that firms need to think about those holistically. What are we trying to achieve with this for ourselves and for the, the broader context? Thanks, Karen. Um, uh, a question that I think you might be able to answer, Naomi. So, um, Annabelle's asked is, um, uh, do you see school performance or Ofsted ratings playing an even bigger role in employer selection processes than maybe they, they have to date? To my knowledge, I'm not sure that Ofsted ratings are something that employers look at a lot. And the employees that we work with look at academic outcomes when contextualising. Um, in terms of, and our system allows you to look at A-level results for a particular year group and see how a student performed compared to their peers, which has enabled us to pick out students who outperformed. Um, so, for example, if everyone was getting you know, CCD at your school and you ended up with ABB, that would be a pretty significant outperformance. Um, and so I think employers have been looking at that, those of those who've been working with us. Um, offset ratings, I don't think um, have been looked at as much because um, they, they vary and some are, some are quite old. So um, some schools who get given an outstanding rating that don't then get assessed for many, many years, which I, I think people people have views on. Um, and so I, I, I think our, our current approach is to encourage employers to compare students' performance with, with their peer group where, where they can. Um, and then also to see how that school's performing broadly when compared with the, the general national performance because if students are turning out the sorts of grades even if they're not exactly the, the exact grades that you're looking for from schools that really don't perform very well that's a student who's resilient is outperforming and will most likely do well in your organization with your support thanks Naomi. yeah um, we talked a little about, about this as well as this strand that's kind of across the sort of i think all of our conversation for for sort of the last sort of um at the last um, nearly an hour now um, and we talked about um opportunities that are available virtually now, virtual recruitment, um, which was a little bit about internships and employers that have, that have moved internships or or development programmes virtually. Um, I'm wondering if you've got, anybody's got any sort of either concerns or maybe advice for students around actually how they might be able to develop their employability skills in this difficult period, because again, I think this is one of the challenges of this crisis those routes where students could get, you know, some of those useful life experiences, stuff they could talk to employers about, i.e., um, you know, doing a, a, a part-time job, volunteering, being a carer. I think a lot of those options are a little bit reduced. So has, have any of you got any thoughts on actually some advice we can give to, to students? Because the reality is there are going to be fewer vacancies and opportunities. So how people can make the, the, maybe the best of a bad situation. So I think yeah. one of the things that our students are, are really benefiting from at the moment is the mentoring. And it's always been something that mentoring relationships have really brought to our students is the ability to tell their stories in a way that, that meets what employers are looking for. You know, I hear so often the conversation where a student says, I don't have any examples of team working, uh, being resilient, uh, you know, juggling different priorities and in working with a mentor, they're able to identify that actually by achieving the things that they've achieved in the context that they have achieved them and with the background that they come from, those are impressive stories, but they wouldn't know it and they wouldn't know how to pitch it. And I think that's going to be even more important in this context. You know, I do worry about the demand for everyone to have their sort of heroic COVID story of how I have been, you know, uh, I've learned to crochet and I've taken up the bassoon and I've been volunteering in my street, where actually for lots of people from whatever background, but particularly if you've come from a, a low income background, surviving and getting through and being here is a heroic story, but it may not feel like it. And having the, the ability to, to shape what you have done in a way that that hits the buttons that an employer is looking for is going to be so, so important. Yeah, I mean, developing resilience as a quality is, is obviously going to be important to, to, to um, you know, be prepared for perhaps uh, a slightly slower um, process in terms of uh, getting opportunities within an organisation and being ready for that, being uh, recognising 
that you may need a plan B if that organisation isn't uh, opening up opportunities to, to look at other avenues and uh, routes um, to be as planned and as structured as possible to continue to really have a strategy for your career um, and obviously get support and make sure you're connected as much as possible with, uh, as you say, Sarah, mentors or um, other um, helpful um, stakeholders who may, may be able to assist you. And so I think you're exactly right. Oh, sorry, Naomi. Oh, thank you. Um, there's been a proliferation of content as well in lockdown. Um, I've seen a lot of people, including students actually, producing more podcasts, more blogs, more online meetups. And I've been advising students who are feeling disconnected from the industry they're interested in because maybe their opportunities were cancelled or they can't apply to things in the same way to make sure they're immersing themselves in that world online at the moment and keep up with the industry developments through this content that's out there so that they're still connected and they're still able to understand what the industry is facing currently and where people are organizing. And I've been really impressed by how resilient students have been. I've seen groups popping up, people having meetups and weekly speaker events that they've organized for themselves to link into those groups, one for the support, um, but then also to still feel connected to the industry so that when things do open back up and they can apply to things, they haven't been disconnected. I was going to say, Phil, I think you're exactly right about plan B and they should be having plan C and D. And I think just reframing and not being too hard on themselves around their career path having to be linear and actually treating that as an opportunity to go and do weird and wonderful things whilst maintaining that network, whilst maintaining those mentoring relationships and just being like a sponge and, and not being too hard on themselves that they're, they're, they're perhaps predefined idea of what that early career would look like perhaps isn't actually going to uh, be what, what 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 transpires over the coming years. That's great. I think that's a good point. I sometimes wonder as well. I think some of us have experienced this. What you think is the ideal job is not always the ideal job where you land it. So, so um, yes, that flexibility I think is is a really a really good and important point to to end on. So thank you very much, panelists, for all your time. Really appreciate you um, giving the time and, and sharing um, sharing all your thoughts. We have covered a, a lot of really good, interesting ground there. I'm um, sorry if I didn't get to every single question. I think we covered most of them. Um, but we just had, had so many coming through, I couldn't, couldn't get to them all. Um, as I said at the start, uh, this webinar records automatically. Um, you will get an email with the link. It will also be on our website, so please feel free to share it around um, or go back and, 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 and revisit some of the stuff that you might want to recap. Um, keep an eye out for, the, um, for more stuff we've got coming down the line. So we've got another podcast on social mobility in the pipeline at the moment we're working on. Um, we've got a whole bunch of stuff on actually what the autumn might look like now marketing attraction, how we can um, reach students on, on campus, etc., as well as the general market update. So, so please keep engaged with that. And if we're not covering something you think we should be um, that's pressing at the moment, then please do drop me a line and we will do our best to cover it. So a virtual round of applause to our panellists. Thank you again very much for, for, for your time. Um, hopefully to um, see you all soon. Take care, everybody. Have a good day, rest of the day. Thank, Thank you. Day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.